What is your life? Think about it for a moment. I think it's a sobering question. What is your life? You don't have one of them. You have no idea how long it will last. So what is your life? I think it's a sobering question. As I said, people don't give enough thought to it. But it ought to be done when people are quite young. Parents ought to be instilling the answer to that question. First of all, raising it in the process of teaching their children as they ought to be taught. And in demonstrating the answer to it in the way that they live, choices they make, the examples they set. It would be interesting simply to go to a mall or someplace where people gather and just say, would you answer this question? What is your life? They may want some explanation of what you mean by it, but say, what's the purpose of your life? Why are you here? What are you doing with it? And so forth. From infancy, we are impressed with the fact that life is brief, it's transitory, it's always uncertain. The poet Longfellow ably expressed it in this way. Art is short and time is fleeting. And our hearts, though true and brave, still like muffled drums, are beating funeral marches to the grave. And that doesn't make a difference who you are, male or female, young or old. That's just the way it is. As far as physical things, that's where it ends. And there's no use trying to act like it doesn't because it is appointed unto man once to die. And after this, the judgment, Hebrews 9, 27. Well, let's look at this question Again, emphasizing, what is your life? We look at this answer, which is only a partial answer. Because James asked that question. He did it to sober up his readers, to get them to think seriously about what he had to say to them. And he just simply said, for what is your life? And then he gave the answer, it is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and vanisheth away. James 4 and verse 14. When you think about steam rising from a hot water, and you think about how strong it is as it's next to the source, and yet just a little ways away it's gone. That's what James tried to get us to understand. Therefore, considering the brevity of life and the speed with which it passes. Here's what Job exclaimed in the Old Testament. My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle, Job 7, 6. Now, nowadays, we may have to explain what a weaver's shuttle is. And I think the best way to do is go home and use the Internet and simply look up a shuttle, weaver's shuttle. Don't look up a space shuttle. Look up a weaver show and see how fast all that's moving as it weaves the carpet or weaves whatever it is. And even in the days before mechanical things ran them, as the person who was adept at using them moved everything around to get the weave right, it was almost faster than you could see. And that they were familiar with, and therein is the lesson. So how swiftly... Our lives pass away. And then we're called to meet our God. The scripture reads, Job again, chapter 14, verses 1 and 2, and how many funeral sermons has this been used in? Man that is born of woman is a is of few days and full of trouble. He cometh forth like a flower and is cut down. 
He fleeth also as a shadow and continueth not. So much emphasis in Old and New Testament is given to the fleeting passing of our days. Peter said this, For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. 1 Peter 1.24 So you have the same sentiment about life in the Old and New Testaments. It's appointed unto men once to die. And after this, the judgment. No one's going to escape that. Oh, you may say, if the Lord comes back first, we will, but that's not the point. Most men will face death. Hebrews 9.27 Wouldn't it be better if, in answering the question, what is your life, if we would start teaching that this life was never meant to be of long duration. Yeah, well, what if you live to be 100 years old? What's that to history? That's no time at all. Most of us won't see it that long. And some of us that do will spend about 30 years of that after 70 anyway of just feeling worse and worse and worse. Point is, We've got to get it over to ourselves that we're here for a fleeting short period of time and we don't know where it's going to end. What am I to do with myself while I'm here? So life is the most uncertain thing. You think about young people. Some of you are young. You feel so good. You do this, you do that. You make great plans for the future. Uh, you're in the full bloom of vigor and vitality. Uh, you know, there's not much you think about as far as death is concerned, but you ought to. Those of us who have lived life for a while, and even those who are young, may have had friends that all looked well, but then in a car wreck or some sort of accident or some kind of dire disease, they're gone. And that's what happens all too often. I remember I'd been out of school, I think, out of high school three years. There was a young man who was a year behind me. And we both worked in the summer of 67 at the paper mill. I remember the last time I saw him. I came out of one building and I saw him over on the dock doing something. And I hadn't seen him that much because I'd been out of school ahead of him. But I'd been around him all his life. And the next thing I heard about him was he was dead. He'd gotten drunk and run around a curve too sharp, lost control, wrapped himself around a tree. I remember so well going to the funeral home with Mom and Daddy, and we had known his parents, and he was grandparents and they were all just broken to pieces as you might think but I remember his granddaddy saying I'm old I've already finished my days why couldn't it have been me and since that time period as the years have gone by I've been involved in so many funerals uh, I've seen that disposition of heart we, we don't have any assurance quit telling ourselves we do don't plan for tomorrow as if it's going to happen. Someday it won't, and you don't know when. I told about last week, coming back from taking classes in school, and there was a wreck where a little baby was killed. But there was another time. But I was out with the veterinarian. He was going on a call, and he asked me to go. And uh, so I went. And on the way out there, there was another wreck. We were some of the first ones there. And uh, I said, better stop. Maybe you know enough about things. Maybe help with the situation. Well, they got the man out of the truck. And took out of the car and took him over to the ambulance. John 
not our John. John was the name of the veterinarian. He went over there to do what he could. And his wife was still in the car. She wasn't trapped. But nobody was there when I walked up to that side of the car. She was laying over in the seat. I knew immediately she was in the process of dying. If you ever hear that death rattle, you'll never forget it. Because it's the last few moments of somebody's time on earth. She was not in seatbelt. And I never forget she was laying over this way as I looked in this side of the car. Two boy, three boys in a pickup had come over a slight rise, and they met one another head on. It was all because the man that John was looking after and his wife, who was still in the car, were fighting with one another. And he swerved over in line of those boys. They were hurt very bad. But she hit the windshield and the dash. She had on, I never will forget it, a, a, a new pair, or at least nearly new pair of blue jeans. And you know, they're hard to tear, just to simply tear them, just straight across, grab them and try to get them to tear. But she had hit that dash so hard across the seat of them, he just pulled them apart. And I stood there a minute realizing with her eyes set and the gurgle in her throat just wasn't going to last, and it didn't. But we went to visit with the boys. They were young, and it wasn't their fault. I was able to visit them in the hospital and visit with their parents because there was an opportunity there. Never did know for sure what happened with the man. And I thought after that, and that was years and years ago, that was one instance in these United States. How many times did it happen that night all over these United States? Even more so now. Listen, guarantee me right now it will not happen to you as you go home this afternoon and not be your fault at all. What is your life? Well, since we can't control those things, the sensible thing is be prepared at all times to depart this life. Life is the most uncertain thing. Proverbs writer said in Proverbs 27, 1, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring. Now, you know about relevant and up to date, if that was a thousand years from now, it would read in the present. It takes a fool to tear down and build bigger barns to store tomorrow's harvest while ignoring the providential care of God. Life is uncertain. Death is sure. What an adage. It's been around a long time. But it seems like it always is somebody else. The scripture reads again in Psalm 90, verses 9 through 10, We spend our days as a tale that is told. The days of our lives are three score years and ten. And if by reason of strength they be four score years, yet is their strength the labor and sorrow. For it is soon cut off and we fly away. Psalm 90. Verses 9 and 10. We get so encumbered with things, so caught up in catching the coon, <laughs> so caught up in those particular matters. We need to hear our Lord say to a very good woman and one of his best friends when he was in the living room teaching, and she said, Lord, would you have my sister come in the kitchen and help me? And he just simply said, Martha, Martha, Mary hath chosen that better part. Well, did that mean what Martha wanted to be done wasn't necessary, needful? But lots of things in this life are necessary and needful to this life. But we have to get our perspective straight 
We have to get everything in order, and that's the reason you have Matthew 6.33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. God simply has never given us a guarantee that we'll even reach the age of 70. It is difficult for me because life goes by so fast to realize that in three and a half years I'll be 80 and a few of you are 80. It came rather quickly, didn't it? And I look at some of you who are much, much younger than that and I say, look at some of us. There's where you're going to be by the time you turn around twice. It just happens that way. If you live. One thing about an older person, and I am one of those, <laughs> is that as far as the young people are concerned, I've been where you've been. You haven't been where I've been. And you may never get there. How much longer I'll be here and some of the rest of us that are roughly my age or older, we don't know. But I can tell you one thing. You get to be past 70, you start noticing that the old body starts telling you it's not going to be as long as it used to be, regardless of how you leave this world. I used to preach, in fact, I'm preaching a sermon now that I preached in 1967. Well, in 1967, let's see, that put me 21. I go back and preach some of these sermons because I preached them when I was young, and they've been in a file all these years. And since I've been going through things, I've dug them out. And I thought, well, will they still work like they did then? But now I'm past that three score years and ten. But I wasn't anywhere near it then. And I was preaching to a lot of people then. In fact, most of them were all older than me. <laughs> And many of them by this time, in fact, most of them have all gone on. But you know, it's just an old work word, relevant and up to date as it can be, as it was in 1967. It was also our Lord who warned of the deceitfulness of riches because life is not measured by material things. I don't think people as a whole ever learn that's the case. Because they keep striving after material things. Take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. Luke 12 verse 15. Wonder why that's in your Bible. And how do you apply it to your life? Laying up treasures in this world. Won't assure longevity. Death calls in the homes of the rich as well as in the hovels of the poor. Some of the world's greatest men have lived in abject poverty. You may not know it, but we hear Socrates. You may at least have heard of him. But he was a very poor person, economically speaking. He lived in poverty. And yet he made some very great, great contributions to mankind through his observations. Our Lord himself, above all, stated that the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head, Matthew 8.20. My mother used to say something that I, as a younger person, didn't realize it as much as I do now. But she says, the more you have in this life, the greater trouble you got. A lot, of, a lot of truth to that. Concerning Christ, the Apostle Paul wrote to Christians in 2 Corinthians 8, 9, and he was encouraging them to give like they ought to give of their means when he says, for your sakes, he, Christ, became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Think about that for a minute. We are rich indeed through his grace and mercy in the gospel, but it was because he became poor. I, I wish there was some way I could imagine what he left when he left heaven and became a man, but I, I can't. 
I know enough about it to know it's far beyond what I can ever begin to, to understand. And Jesus said in John 10, verse 10, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Yet, he didn't have what the foxes and the birds have. Remember, it was Peter and John going up to the temple who concerning the lame man said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I unto thee. And then, of course, healed his lameness, Acts 3, 6. But now, since they had nothing of this world's good, would, would we contend that they didn't live life to the full? Who would say that John and Peter and the rest of them of that caliber didn't live life in its fullness. Because a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. There are some who think that life is a constant labor for food and for raiment. And they worry themselves sick over it. And if you will watch your television any at all, the news or what's going on, look at the political stuff. I find it interesting, having been in college back in the 60s, and I studied political science and studied history at that time, and, and I, I look at things today and everything in between, that's well over 50 years ago, and politics pretty much is the same now as it was then. They haven't. What have they done for this country? All the promises that are made by presidential candidates and U.S. Senator candidates and governors, what's the difference? How, how much of an impact have they made on anybody that's changed the way this old world works? Oh, there's some things. I understand that. But as far as the history of the world is concerned and human governments, there's so much that so many political people promise, and they don't make any difference at all. So life is far more important than wonderful clothes and a big nice car and a fine house and food and raiment. And thus the Lord gave us the account of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16, 19 through 31. And I know that the fellow there who had it all where he was the moment after he died is in a state of torment. And he had none of what he had accumulated and kept for himself. Jesus has asked the question, is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Matthew 6, I think verse 25. Surely God has a higher goal for all of us than those things. So Jesus taught us not to be anxious about such things as that. What we eat and drink and what we put on, all this stuff. And now we're back to Matthew 6, 31 through 34, specifically verse 33, where he's teaching on that very point. How that you live your life decently and in order. These things have always been something that since the time that we married, Living on the preacher's salary, I always felt like the brethren paid us just what they thought we were worth. You have to think about that for a while. Nevertheless, we lived on it. And we managed to get by and raise four kids. We were never wanting for hardly anything. We had to be careful how we spent things. I told some of my grandkids the other day, I said, back when we had a, I think we were still having the kids. I don't believe they're all here. We lived in Van Buren. We had a budget. And the budget for groceries for one week. Now, I know inflation makes a big difference nowadays with that. But we lived on $25. That's what we allowed ourselves to spend for groceries. <laughs> Things change. But God saw us through. Never had anything come up where extra money beyond our budget was required. It always worked out some way. We prayed about it. We went right along. We pulled the belt tighter. 
we made sure we got the check real quickly into the bank on Sunday uh, in the bank on Monday morning. But it's always worked out. Always has. If I'd gone into preaching for the sake of making money, I I would have been a very poor investor indeed. Life is not gratification of lust. Boy, that's a big one that needs to be understood. Many beguiled and foolish young people in well, young men and women in general think life is just, as they would call it, living it up. And they mean by that gratifying the sensual lust, seeking after selfish pleasures. I presume that no young man ever tasted more of this than what the ladies are studying right now in the ladies' class, not as Solomon, and what the preacher had to say about such things as that. But after he had dissipated himself in a search of world entertainment and in this sensual lust, he said, all is vanity. If you try to find happiness and use your life for those things, it's pointless. And so a whole lot of people in their days, do you know the age bracket that has the highest percentage suicides it's older people and I'm convinced that one reason for that is they get to the end of their days their health falling to pieces they know they're never going to be able to be what they used to be and that was after all they were always looking ahead thinking about they're always going to be here even though they knew they weren't going to always be here they made their plans that way and thus they have no hope of eternal life they don't have much of a belief in God or even if it is it's a corrupted concept of God in eternity and they just end their days a much wiser man wrote these words rejoice O young man in thy youth and let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth and walk in the ways of thine heart and in the sight of thine eyes. This I concludes. But know thou that for all these things God will bring thee into judgment. Please ask these 11 9. I suggest to you that's part of the message of Ecclesiastes. Ladies, we'll probably go over that again, but nevertheless, that's exactly what it is. So when he had tested all that this life had to offer and he could do it as much as anybody ever could having the power and wisdom and the riches that he had, he then said what we quote so much, so much around here and all other people who study their Bible and try to learn what life is and have asked the question, what is your life? He said, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or evil. Nothing's hidden from God. We talked about that last week. And doesn't that about sum up what life's all about? To so live that when you can stand before God, you will stand before him having lived your life a faithful servant. You may have died a pauper. You may have died a wealthy person who earned your money honestly and used it for good things, well and good. But the thing that really made the difference whether you had much of this world's goods or not was that you were faithful in all things. The brevity of life, the certainty of death, and the inevitability of the judgment. These all repeat God's sober warning. Prepare to meet thy God. Amos 4 and verse 12. Tomorrow, you don't know what's going to be here or not. The grim reaper may well be waiting outside these doors this afternoon. It's happened so many times. So I simply close before we offer the invitation. I ask you honestly, as you search your mind and God searches it, and you know your Bible, what is your life right now? If you need to obey the gospel, what's holding you back? 
If you die now, you're in your sins and you don't know but that you will. And you will someday. And you can't go to heaven. I think of what hell must be like when there are parents there and they see their children coming into hell. And they knew they played a part in them arriving in hell. I don't think there's any way human words can describe such a thing that would make hell more hellish than that. And those you claim to love the most, by your life you did not give them the influence that could have encouraged them to obey the truth. That was your responsibility whether they did or they didn't. And then you, by not obeying the gospel, what kind of an example are you setting for those younger than you or anybody around you? Does the word of God make no difference to you? Does the death of Christ mean nothing? Does his suffering mean nothing? Does his blood shed in shameful conditions and painful conditions for you? Does it mean nothing? Is there nothing that can prick your heart and make you want to respond to the good blessings of Christ when he says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am lowly, meek and lowly in heart. Ye shall find rest in your soul. Why leave this building today when you know you may never see home again? If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we beg of you to come while we stand and sing.